Greetings. This is Michael Earlywine. I'm the founder of the All Music Guide, allmusic.com. It's the largest collection of music reviews, ratings, and discographies on the planet. The following interview is part of the Michigan Music Project. Videos on noteworthy musicians, artists, venues, and music experts in the Michigan area. And source material for a documentary that we're putting together on the Michigan music scene. So I was listening to all this Chicago blues, and 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 I still love listening to the Chicago blues. I on my little iPod, iPhone, I have Junior Wells and Little Walter and Junior and uh, Little Walter, Big Walter. I just I love that stuff. <clears throat> still listen to it. But one of the other huge influences on my playing was uh, Charlie McCoy. Uh, the cha the um, Nashville session harmonica player, who during the 70s and 80s and 90s was like the number one harmonica player in Nashville, and also was then went on to be uh, on Hee Haw, and he was actually the musical director of Hee Haw was Charlie McCoy, the harmonica player. But I got one of his records called The Real McCoy back in the late 60s, probably 67 or so, and just studied that as well. And and many years later, I talked to him and said, well, where, where was your inspiration for learning how to play like that? He said, oh, Little Walter. I listened to Little Walter like crazy when I was a kid. But then he was in Nashville, and he just applied what he learned to the country music. But he had a song that I learned way back in 1967, and just note for note, playing along with the record, but really taught me how to be precise and hit the notes clearly and hit all the bends and all the chord changes. It's called The Real McCoy. <laughs> I still remember it. <laughs> it's cool. It, and it was just so all these different harmonica players brought different things, you know, just and timing and feel and accuracy and and the bends. Of course, one thing about harmonica is the bent notes that you can't get them. You, know, you can get them on a violin or something or a slide trombone, but you can't get them on a keyboard. You can bend a little bit on a guitar, but all this so. Uh, that kind of sound that just uh, grabbed my heart and I just wow that's what I wanted to do so and so each of these harmonicas would have a different each of the harmonica players would have a different strength and I'd try to learn everything from every harmonica player that I could you know and and, and then going back into other styles, uh, like old German things, like... You know, anything. I just love to see what a harmonica could do. You know, just try different things, you know. Play different kinds of music, different styles of music, and... And uh, so I started out 
in folk music groups just around my high school. And uh, then the next thing, I got into a little blues band in Chicago called the Stanley Moss Blues Band. I was 18 years old. It's all what kids my What age. kind of what pieces? What what did they, what did you what kind of instruments? Oh, so I was in this uh, Stanley Moss Blues Band. Stanley was a guitar player, was a bass player, a drummer, and myself on harmonica. It was pretty much a straight ahead blues quartet, you know, just and uh, we didn't work very much. We rehearsed a lot, <laughs> had a few gigs. And uh, that didn't last very long, but uh, that was my first. Oh, actually, I was in a soul music band even before that, the Soulful Seven. And the Soulful Seven was also bass, drums, guitar, harmonica, four white guys, and the other three were three black singers. And we all had matching outfits. We all had turtleneck, gray slacks, black shoes, turtleneck shirts. And we all did, we were doing soul music. We were doing uh, Junior, well, Junior Walker and the All Stars and, and we were doing Motown stuff. What kind of stuff would you play for them? Could you give us a sample? I mean, what, what type of harmonica did they want from them? Junior Walker and the All Stars, I'd love to hear. What, what, yeah. what were you playing uh, for that? So let me think. Uh, Jamming along cool. with the guitar and and the, the three singers would dance. You know, it was based out of Evanston, Illinois. What about um, just side notes about some of the other white players? Like I'm sure you met Charlie Musselwhite and Paul Butterfield. And mm. how, did well, you learn some? Any of them <coughs> influence you? Paul Butterfield was definitely a, a big influence, and uh, I bought when his record first came out. Also. Just about the same time Hoodoo Man came out as Paul Butterfield's first record came out, and uh, I bought that. I, I I dug it, and then sixty probably sixty seven is when I got the second one that was uh, East West, and that wow, that was very cool. That was taking taking it into a new new sort of thing altogether, Take, removing it. His, his first record, the first Paul Butterfield record, he was just basically covering Little Walter songs and and doing a fine job of it. But then East West, like these extended jams and kind of combining blues with psychedelia kind of sort of thing. And, uh, and that was cool. And then later on, Paul Butterfield pl started playing more in third position. Very cool stuff, and I, I I learned a lot from his third position playing, which would be like on a C harmonica. That would be a um, key of D, where you start on the first note inhaling, and you can get a major key or a minor key is the major or you could get the minor right there too so that's, that's cool I don't, I don't think I ever played third position no, so that's beautiful so I learned um, a lot about third position from listening to uh, James Cotton and listening to um, Paul Butterfield. And Junior Wells would play occasionally in third position too. But, and, and so would uh, Little Walter, but it would mostly be on a chromatic harp where Little Walter would play third. Sometimes on some other things. So uh, 
I and I I liked uh, Charlie Musselwhite too. I I never had any of his albums, but I knew people that did, so I listened to their <laughs> listened to his albums at someone else's house. And it was many many years later that I met him. He's a very nice guy. Uh, he lives out in California. Now. Uh, so I just tried, as, as I say, I tried to listen to every harmonica player I could hear, and I learned something from all of them. And I tried playing all these different kinds of music. So my, uh, now I'm remembering another band, even earlier than the Soulful Seven and the Stanley Moss Blues Band, I had a duo called Petey Tweedy. Oh. Petey, <laughs> there's two of us named Peter. And, and the Petey Tweedy Band, or the Petey Tweedy Underground Experimental Band, and my friend Pete Swinnerton <clears throat> played some guitar. He played some clarinet. He, he just, he played uh, anything. He, he played flute quite well. And I'd play guitar, a ukulele. We'd stuck a microphone into a ukulele and played slide ukulele and and put a sponge on top of a microphone and had a electric drum and just we were way out there. I mean, <laughs> we weren't we were just having fun and being really experimental. And I, that's another side of me that I like to do is just. And what kind of stuff were you playing? What anything? We were playing anything. We were we were playing. Folk music. We were playing blues. We were attempting to play rock and roll. We were just—it was a—it was just a big mess. But we were having so much fun. And we'd just get together and jam, and we, you know, we played a couple of youth group church basement things, you know. And so for and you know, our pay was a free meal or something, you know. So well, something that you're kind of famous for, or that I've heard you play. Uh, is some jazz, uh, and I was the first mm. time I heard you do take five or something. I was yeah. shocked. Yeah, uh, can you play a little bit of that, or is that something? That yeah, well, soon after. Uh, when was it? It was like 1969. I was at a in Chicago at my parents' house, and a friend of mine from this youth group in Oak Park calls me up, and says there's going to be a jam session at my house. There's these classical musicians from Interlock and Arts Academy, uh, but they're um, then they're doing a concert at Orchestra Hall. But afterwards, some of them are staying at my house, and we're going to have a jam session in my basement. So, so I yeah sure why not? So I went over there, and one of the musicians was Chris Brubeck, the son of Dave Brubeck, and we had it was really a fun. Fun jam. He played some guitar. He played bass. He played uh, trombone. It was ba another bass player, a drummer from the from the orchestra. And there's some local kids, and we had this jam session, and it was just fun, you know. And then at the end of the night, I said, "Well, that was fun. Nice meeting you." And and Chris says, and Chris was uh, I was. Uh, See, I was 20 years old, and he was 17. Oh. And he said to me, next year, I'm going to graduate from high school. And when I graduate from high school, I'm going to put together a band, and I want you to be in it. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> I was just laughing, you know. And he said, well, you know, give me your uh, name and address, you know. And I, so I wrote down my phone number, and gave it to him and and left thinking ha huh, what a what a funny little kid this is <laughs> what a, what a dreamer you know huh he's going to make a record next year when he graduates ha huh. and i just thought nothing of it and a year later i'm in albuquerque new mexico so that, that must have been 1968 yeah, it was 68 when I had this jam session. A year later, I get a letter forwarded from my mother's house, my parents' house, down to 
Albuquerque, where I was staying, and I opened the letter. Chris Brubeck, I'm going to graduate from high school in May 1969. I want you to come up, and we're going to make a demo record, a demo recording. It's the first I'd heard from him in a year. I thought, oh, this kid's serious. All right, I'll do it. So I hitchhiked from yeah. Albuquerque, New Mexico, up to my parents' house, and then up to Interlochen. But my hitchhiking was too good. I got there too early. And at Interlochen, everyone's wearing these uniforms. They're wearing white shirts and blue knickers. And I, I show up and I find them. And I say, you can't be here yet. Wow. We'll have to hide you in the dorm. You know, so, so I was like hiding in the dorm. And they were smuggling me peanut butter sandwiches and stuff. And then I was discovered. Someone. Someone discovered me, and and this was a major infraction to have someone. But it was like the day before I was going to graduate, they couldn't really kick him out of school then. If it had been October or something, they might have kicked him out of school. But and so <laughs> the trombone teacher, at Mr. Sporny, he came to my rescue and said, oh, you can't stay in the dorm here. You can stay in my office. You can take, put your sleeping bag under my desk in the office and sleep there. So I just had to wait one more day. And then there's the graduation ceremony happened, and I was hiding out. <laughs> and then everyone left, but they had access to the radio station with the recording equipment. And they had reel-to-reel -reel tape, and they made a demo tape for the next few days. So the graduation happened. I was hiding out. But then we recorded at the the radio station. And they had microphones and reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders, and we made a demo tape. And right away, it was I was in way over my head. They, they said, "Well, this one's in seven-eight time." I said, well, "What's seven-eight time?" And it's, well, it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, Wow, what's that? You know, I'd never heard any music like that. But. So, uh, but then there was other things that were kind of more rock and roll or blues based, and I could hang tough with those things. Finally, I did learn how to play in seven eight time, it, and I learned it by uh, walking. Like one two three four five six seven one two three four five six seven one two three. Four, four. So if I'd walk in 4-4, four, four, but I'd count in 7-4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, and I started, my first 7-8 tune that I'd practiced was a Sonny Terry thing, which was a jump down, turn around, pick a bale of cotton. Going to jump down, turn around, pick a bale of day. But I just took an eighth note off it, so it was... And so that I would practice that for hours until I got used to seven. And I got used to seven. And then, oh, well, this one's in 5-4. Oh, this one's in 9-4. And he, Chris had just grown up with this. His, his, his dad, Dave Brubeck, and Paul Desmond and Joe Morello had, had just pioneered jazz in these odd, odd time signatures. And from when Chris was a little kid, he used to, he told me he used to crawl under the piano and listen to the to the rehearsals from underneath the piano and <laughs> soak us all in. So for Chris, odd time signatures were nothing, but for me it was a big deal. And I but I learned how to do it, and so I joined his band. And then later that summer, uh, the same summer, toward they they sent these. Uh, demo tapes around and they uh, they got a guy in California interested his name was Juddy Phillips and he was the uh, the nephew of Sam Phillips of Sun Records and so he had grown up in recording studios he had a gig out in California where he was an engineer in a recording studio all day but then he had 
the use of the studio all night. So we'd go in at 10 or 11 at night and record until 3 or 4 in the morning. And then uh, we did that for a week and got a whole other set of demo tapes. More. Our first was in quarter-inch tape, and then the next one was like 12-track, two-inch tape. You know, wow, I was in the big time now. I was state of the art because here I was recording 12 track stuff this was 1969 the Beatles did all their all their stuff on four tracks you know wow. <laughs> here, here I'm in the big time studio you know so uh, and that led to a record on RCA and the next yeah. summer we recorded in Chicago on RCA records so here I am now in this band, New Heavenly Blue, with Chris Brubeck. And uh, playing all sorts of stuff. Yeah, Because everyone else in the band was classically trained. And uh, one of the guitar players also played viola, and the other guitar player also played violin. And Chris was playing piano and bass and bass trombone. and. We had a very eclectic band. Wow. And so I st stuck with them, and we did a record on RCA. And uh, uh, I went back to college for a couple more semesters and then dropped out. And I said, I wanna, I don't, I'm not learning anything in college. I can be in this band full time. So I moved to Ann Arbor in 19. I was. In Ann Arbor during the summer of 1970, but I, in 1971 I moved to Ann Arbor and stayed and never left. What What did some of the jazz harmonica sound like? Can you play anything that I'd yeah. like to hear? So uh, after um, playing with the New Heavenly Blue, then we had a second record that was on Atlantic Records. And... Uh, Neither one of the records sold very well because the band was a little too eclectic. It was too out there. It was great music. But uh, but then my... I, I was ordered... Then Chris's older brother, Darius, invited me to join his band called the Darius Brubeck Ensemble. And that was... Uh, Danny Brubeck on drums, the young, the younger brother, and uh, Chris Brubeck on bass and trombone, Darius Brubeck on keyboards, a guy named Perry Robinson on clarinet, um, and Jerry Berganzi on tenor sax, and myself on harmonica. And the, sometimes there was another bass player, too, so Chris could play more trombone. So then I was playing in a horn section in a jazz band. And there was a very unusual horn section, because it was bass, trombone, tenor sax, clarinet, and harmonica. But we had our parts, and we'd do, we'd do charts together. And I just learned how to keep up. You know, I, I didn't want to lose this gig. So I'd already been woodshedding hours and hours every day, and I just continued to try to learn this stuff. And some of it was pretty intricate. Like we'd do things like... Uh, So I'd be switching harmonicas to go through the different wow. things. And I learned uh, back then this kind of a cool trick, how to switch harmonica very quickly. You put the one you're about to play on top, and then you pull the one out from the bottom. So you'd be playing something like... So you could like switch, <laughs> wow. switch keys quickly and then um, I just learned how to 
find the notes that I needed to find, just somehow. So, um, one of the songs we would do was uh, Take Five. learning by doing and woodshedding so I wouldn't lose my gig. <laughs> Incredible. And also, you traveled, I think, didn't you play with Dave Brubrick yes. himself? Tell us a little bit about your travels <clears throat> and with that kind of stuff. So, in the mid-70s, Dave Brubeck would uh, sometimes do shows with his quartet, but also have the Darius Brubeck band as opening act. And uh, so then I'd be on the, on the show with uh, Jer Jerry Mulligan on saxophone or Paul Desmond on, on sax, on alto sax. Um, Joe Morello wasn't playing with him anymore at that time. He had a guy named Jack Six on bass, and Alan Dawson on drums, who was just an amazing jazz drummer. And so we'd have this huge group, and we did we did quite a few sh shows with the the two bands together. And then Darius. Uh, became the band. He, Dave decided, well, I'm going to disband the quartet and just use Darius's band as his band. You know, so it was called Two Generations of Brubeck. And it was you know, Dave Brubeck, Darius Brubeck, Chris Brubeck, Danny Brubeck, plus a guy named Dave Powell, uh, Jerry Braganzi, Perry Robinson, and myself. So it was like 11 pieces and we'd be on the road. And then uh, later on, it cut back to 10 pieces. And then the nine, and then eight, and then seven, and then six, and five. And I'm still holding tough. I'm still in there. It was four Brubecks and myself. Oh. And this was over many years. So I was touring with Dave Brubeck for five and a half years or something like that. Wow. All during the late 70s. And then, uh, oh, and I used to just, I'd be sitting at home and I'd open up my mail and there'd be some plane tickets and say, in an itinerary and say, well, we have a gig in San Francisco. And, and, you know, and on that, it's San Francisco, Seattle, and Portland, and then you fly home. And then we're going to do another, you know, get these things in the mail and then uh, I stopped getting letters in the mail. They never they never fired me. They never <laughs> told me. I guess none of them had the heart to tell me that I wasn't in the band anymore. I just stopped getting huh. letters in the mail. Um, and you know, and I'd see, oh, well, there's the four of them are playing in South Africa and I'm not there. Well, I guess I guess I'm not in the band anymore. And so uh, I thought then, well, now what? You know, because all during the whole decade of the seventies, I was uh, playing with New Heavenly Blue, or oh, there's another band in there I didn't mention, Sky King, Chris Brubeck's funk band. I was in that too, so and that was really fun and. A funk band playing in odd time signatures. It was very cool. We, hmm. and we, we had a record on Columbia. But all these, uh, so by the time I was you know, 26 years old, I'd been on Atlantic Records, RCA Records, and Columbia Records. But then I'm late, very late 70s, I'm, 
I'm unemployed. And I'd never had to learn how to get a gig in my life. I, it was always, here's a gig, you know. <laughs> so I had, I had to figure out, well, now what, you know. And the first thing I did, I used to go to the Ark in Ann Arbor to sit in with whoever needed a harmonica player with all the folk musicians that came by, you know, with uh, Rosalie Sorrells and Utah Phillips and you know, Steve Goodman and, Paul Jeremiah and Paul Siebel and just accompanied lots and lots of people. And this guy, Bob White, comes and a folk singer, you know, nice voice, played guitar. And uh, he said, oh, I got some gigs, why don't you, you know, come along and we'll have a duo. So that was the next thing I did is accompany Bob White around the Midwest a little bit. And he'd sh he showed me you know, about the folk music circuit that I had no idea anything about because I'd been playing I'd, I'd been playing blues bars and rock and roll places with Sky King and New Heavenly Blue and I'd been playing Carnegie Hall <laughs> and Lincoln Center with Dave Brubeck. I didn't know how to anything about folk music clubs, but I knew how to play so. So then I started uh, accompanying uh, Bob White and then in, and learning where the clubs were and what they were all about and how to get a gig there. And, and then, then the next thing is I was doing a solo. I'm playing guitar. I'd been playing guitar off and on the whole time and putting a you know, harmonica on a rack. Most people that play guitar with a harmonica on the rack, they're good guitar player and just play a little bit of harmonica but I was a good harmonica player that played a, good, a little bit of guitar so <laughs> kind of the off, other way around but uh, started doing solo shows in the early 80s and then got a bass player to join me and some things and then got a bass player and a drummer and then pretty soon I had a band and for a while I had Danny Brubeck in my band and and then the band would fall apart and I'd be solo again and then I'd get a duo and then a trio and then the band would fall apart and I'd be solo again. <laughs> That's how it went after that for years and years until I got into a duo with uh, Sherry Kane, Mad Cat and Kane, and that lasted pretty near 25 years. Wow. Um, but... Uh, and during that 25 years, I'd sit in with people and I'd be guests on things and play for TV commercials and radio commercials and, and be a guest on lots of recordings. Um, I think I've been on 120 LPs and CDs as a hmm. playing you know, a song or two here and there. What are you doing now? What what? And so now I still play solo shows. I, I have a band in Brazil. <laughs> with, which, so I go to Brazil about once every year or maybe once every other year. Well, it's been, I think, 15 times in 20 years or something like that. Uh, what? Uh, um, so blues band in Brazil. They're all really into... Everyone in the band is a really good blues player. They're all younger than I am, but they've all done their homework. So I have a band in Brazil, which is just, you know, a couple of weeks a year. I have, I sit in with lots of people. And I have the new, uh, my new band, two and a half years old, the Mad Cat Midnight Blues Journey, with Drew Howard on guitar, Captain Midnight. Mark Schrock on bass, and Mike Shimon on drums when we can get him. He's a busy guy, so sometimes we use uh, Randy Marsh on drums. And uh, that's been great, because uh, after 25 years of playing just harmonica and guitar, it's nice to have a bass and, and drums back in the band. and. It's a whole lot of room for improvisation, and all these guys are great improvisers. So we have a 
yeah, that's that's my main focus these days is getting work for that band. I have a couple of questions for you. Where where did the name Mad Cat come from? Mm -hmm. Back when I was in uh, high school, and I was the only one of a very few people in my high school that were interested in blues. It was a huge suburban high school, all white suburban Republican stronghold. <laughs> and here I was wearing a black leather jacket and listening to blues. I was definitely an outsider. And, uh, but I'd be wearing a black, black leather jacket and a madras shirt and listening to blues. So I didn't really fit in with the greasers or, you know, I, I just didn't fit in, but I was my own thing and I didn't care. But amongst my blues loving friends, we all, we made nicknames up for each other because we all were listening to blues and the blues players that we really loved had the coolest names. Junior Wells, Muddy Waters, Little Walter, Magic Sam. Pine Top Perkins, Lightning Hopkins, yeah, you know, just they had these great names. So we thought, well, we need great names too. So, so kind of amongst us, we made nicknames for each other. There was Magic Stan. <laughs> there was uh, Red Boom, and there was uh, his brother Big Boom, and there was. Uh, Sunnyland Seidenberg, <laughs> just, just silly names, and I got this name Mad Cat, and just it was just a joke nickname that only you know only a handful full of people ever knew it at all, until I joined New Heavenly Blue in 1970. So this is like four years later, I joined this band, and the drummer in the band was named Peter. He was an established drummer in the band. They said, well, do you have any nicknames or anything? I, yeah, I said, yeah, you could call me Mad Cat. Said, oh, yeah, we'll call you Mad Cat. And so I moved to Ann Arbor and didn't know anyone except the band, and they introduced me. This is Mad Cat. He just moved here from Chicago. This, this is Mad Cat. And so, so once I moved to Ann Arbor in 1970 and then returned in 71 and stayed, I was Mad Cat from then on. Just, hmm. This is Mad Cat. Wow. Um. Well, when I got back into folk music after being in this jazz and rock and roll world, I realized that Michigan had a lot of a lot of great folk music happening here and some great festivals. And the first one I went to was uh, Wheatland Festival. And and I'd been going to the, to the Ark, sitting in with people for so long, and I knew all these touring folk musicians, and they were going to these festivals like Wheatland. I thought, oh, I better check it out. And I went up there, and then uh, a few years later, I got hired to, to play there. And, and that was the, the first one. And then I, I'd heard about other ones. Uh, and little by little, I got my... And from playing solo shows around the state of Michigan, and especially in the Kalamazoo area, that's where I kind of got my foothold. Kalamazoo and Ann Arbor, playing at Mr. Flood's party in Ann Arbor. And so I, got, I was interested in the folk music world in Michigan, and I just kept, you know, kept pursuing uh, that kind of music and. I first met Seth at uh, Farm Fest in uh, Johannesburg, Michigan. And then I think the next year I met Seth in May. I, and uh, I liked these these kids. They were they were fun kids. They were playing some great stuff. And I liked how they were uh, mixing different kinds of music together. And, and they weren't afraid of electric guitars. When I sure remember the, you know, when Bob Dylan played electric guitar at Newport and caused a riot, you know, <laughs> just people, 
in the old days it was folk music was this thing and rock and roll was this thing and you couldn't you couldn't mix them it was like taboo to to try to mix the two and then you know uh, Bob Dylan was you know had Michael Bloomfield play with him and it just like really stirred things up you know and but people have gotten over that by now <laughs> and I'm really delighted at the way Seth in particular mixes acoustic and electric together in such a beautiful way and why not so and of course I've been playing both electric and acoustic music all these years and so for me it was perfectly natural to put them together of course, the and the Beatles, you know, were huge at that mixing acoustic instruments and electric instruments together. So, so now it's just what's happening. But I like the spirit of the Earthwork uh, Collective. All these musicians cooperating with each other. Because when I was first coming up in music, uh, the blues musicians were very protective of their uh, of their gigs and of their techniques even you know, someone someone playing like in third position and say what are you doing you know I, and you know some harmonica players wouldn't even tell harmonica players what they're doing they just oh there's nothing trying to hide their techniques and stuff but but more and more there's this sharing and especially in the in the harmonica world I see it a lot I mean, there's harmonica conventions and people are very generous with sharing information with each other and that's the way it is with the earthworks people they they share information they share gigs they you know people sit in with each other and it's and it's really a a nice uplifting environment to be playing music with people that that care about each other and it's really nice I wonder whether you have um, any suggestions we talked about this earlier maybe having you talk about this just one of the things that's also outstanding aside from your music about you is just your perseverance and ability to survive in a field where it's very difficult to mm. to make a living and to have a family and all yeah. that kind of stuff. It, it, we don't have to talk about it, but if you have oh, some suggestions to, to younger people, just how do you do, how did you do it? Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of people just can't seem to do it. Right. Uh, they give up. Yeah. Every once in a while, someone will come up and say, uh, you know, I really you know, want to make a living playing music. And mostly I say, well, that's a foolish idea. <laughs> you know, it's really, really, really hard to make a living making music. And, and so there's some, there's some great musicians that, that I know that really make their money at something else and then they have in their spare time can make fabulous music. But in my particular case, I've successfully avoided real work all these years. Uh, there was nine months in the late 70s where I had a job soldering circuit boards. I'd sit at, da at a table and I'd solder these little components onto circuit boards. And I did that for nine months and to make money. And then I thought, here I am sitting uh, eight hours a day, soldering circuit boards. If I was to get on the phone even half that time, four hours a day, to try to get gigs, then I wouldn't have to solder circuit boards. So that's what I did after that. Mm -hmm. But no one te taught, there is no school that I know of or no program I know of that says this is how you get gigs and it's 
it's hard to get gigs. And also the rules are always changing. Like for a while you got gigs by making a cassette tape and getting Xeroxed promo material, putting it in an envelope and sending it to someone. That didn't work anymore. <laughs> no one has a machine to play a cassette tape. No one wants to read that stuff. Now it's all online stuff. Um, used to be you'd have to call people on the phone all the time. Now it's more email. Uh, but still different people respond in different ways. Some people never answer the emails but will check their phone messages, their text messages. Some people won't check your text messages, but they will respond to leaving a message on their phone. So you, you just have to be diligent if you want to get gigs. And then the other thing is be versatile. Because I've done, you know, I play harmonica. In fact, if someone says, you know, are, are you a blues musician? Well, I say, yeah, well, I play blues, but I also play rock and roll. And, folk music and world music and jazz and I consider myself a harmonica player or I consider myself a musician because I also play ukulele and, and guitar. Uh, but I've had gigs primarily as in a blues band and other times primarily in a rock and roll band and in a jazz band and I've done some things in bluegrass bands and some things in country bands and played a little bit of reggae music and and for many years during the 80s I did school assembly programs to kind of general folk music you know overview and sing along things and so in order to be a musician I had to be very versatile in what kind of music I played, and very persistent in, in learning how to get a gig. And, and as I say, the rules were always changing. For a while, when I had solo, duo, trio, and quartet gigs, it was all in bars near college campuses because they were the ones that were liking the kind of music I was playing. And then after a while, styles changed and no one was listening to blues in bars near college campuses anymore. So then, well then what? Well then you play more outdoor park concerts or then you do more, uh, more arts councils. Hmm. For a while I was doing everything through arts councils and then all the money for arts councils dried up. So now what, you know? So, so it's like a continuously adapting to the situation because you can't the music doesn't stand still and what people like to listen to doesn't stand still and the way people like to listen doesn't stand still before there was you know, live music was when I first moved to Ann Arbor that's what people did because their alternative was going to a movie or watching one of three channels on TV and there wasn't any internet you know and then Things change, you know, so you have to adapt with the times. And I'm still trying to adapt, and I'm still trying to figure out how to do it. And I'm always just a little step behind, but I'm trying to keep up. You, know? well, you seem to be, I know a fair number of musicians, and you seem to be very proactive uh, yeah. in terms of looking after <coughs> your well-being that way. I mean, I don't know. Well, Can't it's think because I'm trying to avoid real work. <laughs> well, right. Well, that's but diligently trying to avoid real work. But then, you know, how, how do you promote yourself? Well, now I know you have to have, well, you used to have to have a website, but I don't know how many people look at websites anymore. You have to have a YouTube channel, you know, I know that. Uh, you have to keep the word out somehow. I used to send out mailings, you know, put stamps on letters. You know. I don't do that anymore. You should have an iTunes presence if you don't. Yeah. For I, example. Right, exactly. A podcast. I, right. But you could do incredible things with your music and 
Yeah, that, some, some people only go to iTunes to find any kind of entertainment now. Right, and that's something. Uh, 2015. I'm gonna. I'm gonna look into that. Yeah. And it used to be you made a CD and you sold that, but now CDs are obsolete. You know, so. There's another new company that I've submitted maybe 50 or 100 podcasts to called Skybrite, B-R-I-T-E. Hmm. Someone that I know. And it's uh, kind of all you can eat for $10 a month of all kinds of audio books and all kinds of stuff. Hmm. So you might want to look into just having – you know, because of the keyword searching in it, you know, harmonica, blues, you, could, mm -hmm. you might come up with people there. But that's mm -hmm. something you probably don't even know about. They're yeah, just, I don't even know about Just starting up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got a lot of stuff there and a lot of stuff on iTunes, a lot of stuff on YouTube. I've got hundreds of videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But those are the kind of stuff you do which you know. I mean, yeah. And I've kind of, you know, I'm not trying to make money because, I'm, you know, I'm retired. But... Um, to me, it's not all about money. It's about getting the word out on what it is that you've done with your life and right. trying to share it with people as much as you can. And mm -hmm. But I have nothing but sympathy for, um, empathy for musicians just because I made my living doing it for like seven years or something, and that was tough enough. <laughs> I mean, we would play at a black bar on Ann Street in Ann Arbor for the whole band of five pieces for $35 a night. Sure. I mean, and bands bands aren't really getting much more than they were in the 70s, to tell you the truth. They're just well, there's some guys, I even know some, that work a straight job and play for free on the weekends just so that they can yeah. have something going for themselves where they are something besides soldering circuit boards or something, <laughs> right? So they can say, I'm, this is what I am. Yeah. I think the whole lot about it right now is, Is everything's becoming localized. I think we've all realized we we can't all be celebrity famous mm -hmm. like Bob Dylan or something like that. But we still yearn to have um, a small group even of people who appreciate what we do. Mm -hmm. and so I think that more and more people are wanting to have the not the 15 minutes of fame even that we used to talk about, but just like a a little audience uh, for that part of ourselves that wants to be heard. Mm -hmm. And so I think that. I see, I see a lot of that happening now. Mm -hmm. um. awesome. Talk a little bit about just, you know, that must be a component in your music, to, uh, at least in terms of, you know, being diligent and mm -hmm. how does it help and what, what is it you do? Mm -hmm. You do some kind of meditation, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to get to it in just a minute. I'm going to center myself here. And we can stop. For, you want to take a break, too? We can break for... Nope. You, you can actually a do 20 a 20-second break. Do a little meditation, right? One thing I learned from all these blues musicians that were such huge influence on, on me was what not to do. And a lot of those guys were really heavy drinkers, really heavy smokers. And uh, and I realized quite early that that I couldn't live that lifestyle. You know, I couldn't. I loved the blues. I loved that music, but I knew that I wasn't didn't want to have be an alcoholic and I didn't want to have a gun in my pocket and I, and I didn't want to have fist fights and shootouts and yeah. and all that sort of stuff and so so fairly early uh, well I guess it was in the late 70s or something I, I discovered meditation and and really was drawn to it deeply and and it changed my life in such a good way and so instead of my mind just flying all over the place in all different directions all the time i i learned through meditation through how to, how to kind of focus to witness the mind, to slow things down 
and not just be scattered and going in all different directions, but kind of pull my senses within and watch what I was thinking. And then, and you do that until you can stop thinking and you can realize that you're watching yourself not thinking. And in that, it, it's a practice. You, have, you can't just do this immediately, but through practice, you can get to that place. And it's so uh, relaxing. And then when you come out of that, you're able to do things more clearly, more function more clearly. And I had uh, an amazing teacher for this, a guru, was Swami Muktananda, also known as Baba Muktananda. And he, he would teach, uh, well, he had several things he would often teach. One was that God dwells within you as you. That you're not separate from God. You're, you're part of this whole, God's creation is the whole universe and you're part of it. And you're not, and since you're part of it, you're not separate from it. You are in it. And you, and you can, uh, I take comfort in that. And when I'm in the right space, you know, things, I can just witness things going along and I don't get so bummed out about if things, something goes not the way I want to. I can kind of get an overview. Oh, this is a passing phase instead of, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> I can get into the, this is just the way it's going now and things will improve and uh, or things will get worse, but things will change and change is what always happens in this world. And in order to function in the world, you have to do something. Um, and it's, you follow your dharma. You, you follow, you do what you're meant to do. And so, well, how do you know what you're meant to do? Well, after a while, I figured out, oh, I'm a musician. Oh, I guess I'm meant to be a musician. I guess I really find happiness from being a musician. I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. So then you just do it. And um, and one of the other things you would say is the highest dharma is to know yourself, to know who you really are. And so how do you do that? Well, you meditate to find out who you really are. But also you just live life to find out who you really are. And so there's the two things. So my wife and I went to... India to live in his ashram for a month in 1978. And when we left there, uh, we, we said goodbye to Baba. And he didn't speak English, but he had a translator right there. And we said, Baba, we're leaving. We're going back home. Do you have any advice for us? And he had told us six things. He said, have a nice family life. He said, continue to do your worldly work. He said, continue to meditate. He said, keep good discipline. He said, see God in each other. And he said, always remember God. And so, wow. If I follow those six things, I'm on the right path. You know, Have a nice family life. Well, sure, that's a great idea. <laughs> and I have had a very nice family life. I've been married to the same person since 1972. I have a very lovely daughter, and we all get along great. Do your worldly work. Well, I used to doubt. I think, well... Baba is so spiritual, you know. I should be playing classical music or something. I shouldn't be playing blues because it's not spiritual. It's this low down, dirty, in the alley stuff. But then I realized, well, that's what I do. That's I play this stuff. I play, but not just blues. I play all sorts of music. But do your worldly work. Just do it. 
just don't fight with yourself about it. Just do it. Um, continue to meditate. Well, I, I do. I try to meditate every day. Sometimes I miss a day and I try to meditate at least a half hour every morning and sometimes more. And then during the day, there's this um, mantra repetition. And sometimes I'll just repeat Om Namah Shivaya or Guru Om or different things. Just You repeat that and it kind of settles things down. Your mind isn't wandering all over and you, you can't be worrying about something if you're repeating a mantra. Uh, keep good discipline. That's, that's, that is sometimes a struggle, but I, I keep good discipline. I take care of my body. I get enough sleep. I get enough to eat. Don't, you know, I, I drink a tiny amount. I have a glass of wine or a beer every month. <laughs> I used to smoke a lot more pot, but I kind of don't do that anymore either. It's just, so keep good discipline. Uh, what was the other one? Have a nice family life. Uh, see God in each other. It's great to see God in everybody and in, in everything. Look outside and, and try to remember this is the whole world and everyone in it and everything in it, and every animal in it, and every pebble is all part of the whole, whole picture, and you're part of it too. So that's, that's how I try to uh, maintain my, my state. Well, Seems to be working all right. Well said. Uh, yeah. I was really fortunate living in Ann Arbor to live about four blocks from the Ark, the original Ark on Hill Street. And I used to go over there um, as often as I could to hear whoever was coming through town. And, and often I'd be able to sit in with whoever was coming through town. And it was a great place to meet musicians and to hear great music. It was a folk music place. And uh, being so close uh, to the Ark was a really important part of me learning how to play with other musicians and uh, learning how to be an accompanist. Because being an accompanist is different than being a, your, your own solo show. You have to, when you're playing harmonica be, behind a singer, you have to kind of weave in and out. And the most important thing is not to step on their vocals. You can't be playing over their vocal. You can be holding a note steady or holding a chord or something, or playing quietly, but you can't be playing something with any movement when there's a vocal going on. And so you have to pick your holes and pick where to play. And so if someone sings a phrase and then there's a space, you can do something in that space. But something that's appropriate for the space, you don't wanna you know, if the song's going along and, and there's a space, you don't want to, you don't want to be doing something that's inappropriate. You want to just, a little phrase or a little tone that enhances the song, enhances, that makes, the, makes it better than it would have been without. And that's another thing I learned a lot from Charlie McCoy. He, he accompanied so many country singers, and I'd listen to him how he'd do it, and he'd just, he'd just paint these little, tiny little things in between the phrases. It made the song so much more alive, and he never, but it never cluttered, and it stayed out of the way. And so, thanks to Charlie McCoy, and thanks for the arc for learning how to accompany musicians. And to me, Big Walter is the ideal accompanist. Oh, yeah. I mean, the yeah. stuff he did, like with the third Chicago Blues Day, Oh yeah, but you know, 
it's as good as the solo itself, but it doesn't oh, yeah. doesn't tread on any of their vocals, and it it mm -hmm. just makes the whole thing happen brilliantly, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned from listening to Paul Desmond oh, wow. is the importance of a melody when you're improvising. And so if he was playing a song and he'd, he would play the melody so beautifully and then he'd play something based on the melody that was even more beautiful than the melody. And, but it would, but everything he played was like a melody. And it wasn't just notes, and it wasn't just riffs, and it wasn't just, you know. I found him much more pleasant to listen to than someone like John Coltrane, who's fabulous and amazing, but it was all this sheets of sound. And, and when you listen to Paul Desmond, it was just always something lyrical. And, uh, and in order to do that, he was always aware of the melody of the song when he was improvising. And that's, that was an important lesson, and I'm glad I learned it. Well, that's another form of accompaniment. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah that, and jazz is totally into that. Mm -hmm. And he's great. Mm -hmm. I've got some great Paul Desmond on mosaic boxes. Some mm -hmm. stuff is pulled out of the vaults that, um, he's just a great sax player. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I believe that the Michigan folk scene is as strong as it is today has to do with elderly instruments in Lansing. And I started going there in the, when they first opened, when they were still in East Lansing and second floor and had a little store. But they, uh, they did so much uh, to supply Michigan with great folk instruments, and that kind of kept the folk community going and interested, and then so many great musicians worked in that store. You know, Joel Mavis worked there, and, and um, Ray Camillay, and just, and over the, and you know, then the guys in Steppin' In It were working there, and just all these musicians that would go there, and it was a, such a hangout to go, you know, go on a Saturday down of the elderly instruments, and there was always some fabulous jam, you know, happening. And I think I just have a feeling that having that influence in the middle of Michigan really shaped uh, Michigan music. And as I go around to other parts of the country, other, there's other kind of styles of music and stuff, but the Michigan folk scene is just fabulous. There's also the, there's the Kerrville, Texas folk music scene that's amazing, and the Austin, Texas music scene in general. And there's you know music scenes in New York and in all the big cities, but, uh, but nothing there's nothing better than the Michigan folk scene. It's just such quality music, and uh, I'm glad to be part of it. Well, you probably know this, but that the greatest American folklorist is, you know, Ellen Lomax, mm -hmm. who said that the richest folk scene that he'd ever mined was Michigan. No kidding. In 1939, he spent. Uh, several months here, and it was the most rich. Yeah, I've heard some of those recordings, and, and yeah, and especially in the UP and the... Yeah, and but also stuff. some incredible blues out of Detroit. I mean, oh, yeah. just as good as anything oh, yeah. that I've heard. I have all of that. And, oh, wow. Um, but that's interesting because uh, it just shows that it's not just... Because one time I had a... I put on a lot of conferences, and one of the conferences I put on twice is a... Um, Vedic astrology, Hindu astrology, mm. and to do that, we a lot of uh, Hindu astrologers came, and because you know they would know Hindu astrology, and they used to walk down the center of our street. We used to worry about them arm in arm, you know, like ten of them, 
just treat streets differently than we do, like something that, in, if you've ever been to India, they use the streets. They're, they're not mm -hmm. like uh, antiseptically mm -hmm. clean yeah. or something. And one of the things they asked me was, where are they? You know, do I have a map of where we are? You know, because they were, here, you know, right here. And so I would get them a map. I got them a map, and I showed it to them, and then their, their eyes kind of bugged out. And he said, you realize that this Michigan is a sacred place because it's a lingam shape. It's a peninsula. Oh, wow. I never thought and of that. And they said, in India, anything that's this way, you know, shaped like a, a male a penis, right? Yeah. They said, this is considered a sacred space. And I think we all know that, what, 21% of all the fresh water in the world surrounds yeah. the Great Lakes. Yeah. And 84% of all the fresh water in North America yeah. That's a huge amount. Yeah. And uh, something I write about a lot is that under under Michigan, not just Detroit, it's the largest salt deposit on Earth. Huh. 30,000 trillion tons of salt wow. under the entire lower peninsula, not just the Detroit area, wow. about 1,000 feet down. So uh, if we just look at those facts, it points to there being something. I mean, those are special facts. Yeah. You know, but they're... Yeah, that's why I'm doing this documentary, because I'm trying to understand what is going on here. And it's hard to put your finger on it, but you know what you just said was really helpful, and that's the kind of stuff I need mm. people to talk about, because it's true. Mm -hmm. And I've seen many people who came, who've come to Michigan who then say that where they come from, I can think of a friend of mine from Boulder who came and played by Lyndon Young. Oh, yeah, I know. And he just says, it's just not like that in Boulder. It's very catty. And, mm -hmm. and I've heard the same thing from people from New York, that oh, yeah. it's very competitive and there isn't any, there isn't this uh, sense of, you know, uh, you know, rising tide raising all the boats, that, mm -hmm. that we can all go up together. We can all be in that number when the saints go marching in, that mm -hmm. kind of thing, that mm -hmm. you don't see that. And uh, anyway, um, any other thoughts? Otherwise, I think we've got a ton. Yeah, you've got a lot. Probably have more than one here and I'll just break them up I have to think about it but I think I might want to send to Stan at Elderly at least the vocal mp3 what you said to help encourage him to come and be interviewed mm -hmm. because I think you know and I plan to do it because, because but I think Elderly has played a huge importance you know more than, than other stores in oh yeah. for sure more than other stores yeah, yeah. other stores are just music stores and